Hey, my name is Enda Murray. I'm the director of the Irish Film Festival. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Alan Gilsonen, director of Ulysses. Alan, you're very welcome to a wet and windy Sydney from a, from a hot, uh, a, a very hot Ireland, I believe. Yeah, sweltering here this morning, but uh, anyway, uh, we're, of course we're complaining. Of course we're complaining. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, 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 tell us about the, the genesis of the project. You mentioned in your notes that the idea for the film began on an island in the south of Brazil, um, which, which is very exotic. Did you tell us about how the project started? Yeah, it was kind of unusual in a way in that many years ago I made a film about, uh, about Yeats, an experimental film about Yeats, and, and particularly Yeats' interest in the occult and theosophy. And uh, that was screened in a festival in Florinopolis, which is a, a beautiful island off the coast of Brazil. And afterwards, the Irish ambassador was there and Professor Margaret Keller, who's the Professor Anglo-Irish Studies here in UCD, both kind of had a simultaneous thought that maybe I could do something similarly experimental about Joyce um, to coincide with the opening of a new museum that's opened here in Dublin called Molly, the Museum of Literature Ireland, which is a, a fabulous place on Stephen's Green. And so that was literally the genesis of, of the film and we sort of took it from there. So, you know, so in a way, as, as, you, as you know, I'm not even sure film is the right word for it. It's, it's almost like an installation or a response to the book. Uh, I knew very quickly that the idea of making a film about Ulysses was a kind of fool's errand. So in a way, I, I see it as a kind of reading of the book or, or maybe even opening a door into the book for people who find it totally impenetrable. So it's very experimental in approach. Uh, it's quite minimalist uh, in lots of ways. Um, but I think the other thing for me, even though I sort of would have studied Joyce in college and did all that stuff and had read Ulysses, I never quite got him. You know, I got Yeats, yeah. I thought, I got Beckett. You know, I had a kind of passion for them. Ye Joyce, I think like a lot of people, I could admire him from afar, but wasn't entirely, I just, I didn't get it in here, you know, in, in my heart. So what was wonderful about making the film was it kind of forced me, you know, into reading, rereading the book. And, and of course, have now developed a great love and appreciation of it. So, uh, yeah, so, and, you know, I hope the film in some small way can do that, that if you, if you watch the film, you might think, oh, maybe it's not as impenetrable as, as I imagine. Yes, I suppose one of the things that I got from the film was the language and the, the, that idea of um, the use of language and um, thinking back to 1922, you know, a description of, of, of the snot green sea to me, um, it, 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 um, it really brought home um, p that possible um, use of language uh, uh, among, of the English language among Irish people. Um, and, uh, and I could see a lot of the humour um, of, of the way language is used. Um, I suppose, um, for me, I, I found that your, your film very accessible. And, um, and, and I found that it um, uh, focused in on, on some of the parts that I thought were translatable. Um, and I came away from it thinking, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe I will have another go because I, I'm one of those people, you know, that, you, as you say, um, it, 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 you know, it, 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 it's un, unreadable as the, as the cliche goes, but, um, and you're suggesting that it's not, it's, it, that it's, it's everything and, and, and more. So um, I, was, I was interested, you said that, that it, it, you hoped it to be a, crea a small creative echo of Joyce's work and life. He was very interested in, in, um, in film. He, 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 of course, he started the Volta in, in 1909, and, and there was a, 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 an interesting. Uh, uh, I, 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 heard, I read that he had um, talked with Sergei Eisenstein, and so 
he had this idea of of his thoughts being being cinematic. Do you want to? Uh, to... Abs absolutely, and uh, I, I think I think he did. And as you rightly said, he he founded the Volta, you know, which was you know an extraordinary thing at the time in Ireland. I, I think it was of the full title was the Volta Electric Theatre, which I always kind of like. Um, and you know, you can see in his work. You know, that, I mean, there's many theories that had he been born decades later, he would have gravitated to film, not uh, literature. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about that, but but there is definitely something cinematic, you know, in in his work, and um, and also, of course, he was restless and he was experimental, and I think he saw film as as kind of the new medium of the time. Um, had endless possibilities, you know, for montage for experimenting with how we see the world and of course he does that in Ulysses and then famously even more so in Finnegan's Wake. But um, but it wasn't made as a film until uh, I think um, 67. Um, uh, so so it, 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 it took a while um, for, 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 for for someone to t uh, t take that challenge. Um. Like, even though I think he draws on cinema in the book, it's it's almost unfilmable, you know, which is ironic coming from somebody who's sitting here talking about a film. But, you know, it's such, so much of the book is about the interior world of the characters. And, um, you know, at, at, and his imagination, which is both kind of very specific, very local, but also co cosmic and universal, um, is almost beyond the scope. You know, cinema is quite literal. You know, I show you something and, and you interpret what it means. It's an image, it's there. Whereas a book opens you up to a multifarious amount of imagery. And so, so in a way, and I'm kind of, I think my film is no different, any filmic attempt to engage with Joyce kind of limits it slightly. So that's why I'd kind of say, well, it's kind of, this is one reading of a multitude of possible readings. Yeah. Um, I, I, I went looking for, in, in terms of um, the, the, the book itself, and it, it was published in, in, um, in Paris in, in 1922, um, but it um, it wasn't available in Ireland until was it sixty seven? Do you know? Can you t talk a little bit about? Yeah, I mean, of course, this year we're, we're you know we're celebrating the centenary of Bloomsday, um, and you know it's interesting. I was actually coincidentally back in 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 Brazil for Bloomsday, and and we were talking and celebrating. There was a huge celebration of. Bloomsday in Brazil, uh, you know, they've issued a stamp to honor the book. Wow. Uh, the Irish Embassy in, in Brazil commissioned 18 murals across the country in universities to mark each episode of Ulysses. And I remember being at a party in, in, in the Irish ambassador's residence and, you know, there were ambassadors from all over the world. And here we were celebrating Bloomsday, which of course is a fictional day. But it's very easy now, today, 100 years on, as we embrace Joyce and Beckett and all these people, to forget that it wasn't an easy path. You know, that Joyce, you know, was, was pilloried, he was censored, you know, he famously, you know, was banned in the United States and there was a court case, Ulysses versus the United States of America, which I think is such a brilliant title. And so it wasn't easy. Joyce really suffered, you know, he's now on tea turtles, we now celebrate and we, you know, there's a, an Irish Navy ship called, you know, the James Joyce. But he wasn't always this figure of national respect, you know, and I think he suffered to write the book and the book suffered through the decades. And it's only really now, a hundred years on from its publication that we can actually celebrate it. You know, and I often wonder, I'm sure Joyce would be delighted in some ways, but you know, I wonder would he also be saying, "Oh well, it's great now, guys. You know, you're all saying I'm brilliant now, but you weren't saying that 100 years ago." Yeah, I wanted to kind of segue there 
you know, um, in terms of Joyce being rejected by the the the, the Irish and and him going away, and um, come back to the first time that I became aware of your work, and I'd been in. Um, in London for a couple of years, I, I, I left in uh, 85 and had been part of that 80s, um, uh, 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 the, the, the emigration. Um, but um, your film, the, the Road to God Knows Where, um, it, you know, for me, I, that was a revelation because it, it, it said uh, uh, a lot about how I was feeling at the time and a lot of other people that I knew. Um, I, I was interested, like whether you would um, still make that same program today, or what? What are your your feelings? I, you know, I think, you know, I'd be of that generation. Many of my friends, like you, would have emigrated to, you know, to Britain, to the States, to Australia. Um, but I think looking back on that film, which at the time drew a lot of attention, partly because there were so few Irish films made, full stop, you know, that there was an energy in that. There was a naivety. You know, I didn't set out to make what became a controversial film. It was absolutely just the response of somebody who, A, had never made a documentary before, um, but also really making that film was like, going to meet your peers, the people, you know, people from your country in the north of Ireland, across Ireland, in London, New York. So, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a sophisticated approach, is what I'm saying. It was kind of an emotional approach. And and I think the film hopefully captured something of that. You know, so sadly I don't think I, you know, I could ever recapture that kind of energy. Um, but there was also, as I can see now, you know, you know, there was a certain amount of anger, there was a certain amount of um, discontent in it, as well as joy and, and, and pride. But, you know, I think there's many other areas, you know, it's very easy now to think, oh, we're all great in Ireland and sure, you know, isn't it fabulous, you know, but, but, but there, there's always room for, uh, you know, for, for standing against the system, for looking outside the system. And, uh, you know, you'd like to think you can still do that, but I guess, you know, there's a certain uh, youthful energy, which maybe I don't have, uh, that I had back then. Yes, I think certainly the, um, uh, you put your finger on the anger, or that was, that was I suppose, the, what, what I tapped into. Um, just, Coming back to Australia again, and, and you worked a, cu a couple of years ago, actually it's 20, 25 years ago now, on the Irish Empire, uh, which, which was a, 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 a another film about um, Irish migrants. Did you actually come to Australia as, as part of that? or No, it, it, I mean, that was a kind of strange production. It was five hours, um, and, and there were a number of production companies, including one in Australia. Yeah, so so I've never actually been to Australia, which you know I'm open to invitations, of course. I'll say that now. Uh, but uh, but that was fascinating because it gave us a chance to look at the, you know, again we think, you know, Irish emigration is, you know, we think first of all, of course, of the states, you know, we think of Britain, then maybe we think of Australia. But I was also interested in the, the kind of global scale of it, you know, very interesting, interested in the Irish migration to Latin America, which I think has been slightly forgotten, and to the Far East, you know. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like a parallel country, you know, as, as you well know out there, you know, the, the emigrant experience. And, you know, while we're aware of it, hopefully now, and while we've embraced it here in Ireland more, um, you know, and I think Mary Robinson's famous gesture of putting a light in the window of Oris Nuthron was part of that. Um, I think, you know, and you'll know this better than I, but I think there's an extraordinary amount of stories out there that haven't been told, you know. Um, and, you know, I think there's always a danger from the homeland to kind of either glamorize emigration or, or see it as an absolute uh, tragedy whereas the truth is probably somewhere between the two. Yep. 
So um, last week I was at uh, the FLA in Galway and um, once again I was um, just, uh, I suppose, the breadth of, of talent there and, and for, for our festival this year I think we, I started off with a short list of 40, 42 films um, uh, and I was just wondering, about, get a comment from you, you, you've been involved with various IFI and, and, and RTE um, how do you see the, the health of, of programme making in Ireland at the moment? I mean, I think it's extraordinary. You know, as, as you rightly say, there is an extraordinary flourishing of, of, of cinema and, and television and all audiovisual production, which was kind of unimaginable when I started. You know, when I made The Road to God Knows Where, you know, there might have been two feature films made that year, maybe a couple of independent documentaries. You know, I remember when I made my first short film, uh, I think there were two short films made in the country. There's probably 2,000 now, 20,000. So that's brilliant, you know, the, and, and, and I think, you know, Irish cinema is, is, is increasingly finding its voice. You know, there's been a fantastic initiative with T.G. Cahar recently, as, as you'll have seen, where there's a number of films in the Irish language that have come out. Uh, that have found an audience, which again uh, would have been, you know, just if you said that 20 years ago, that Irish language feature films were going to find international success. I mean, people would really have doubted that. But um, I, I'm not entirely sure uh, that this just might be the grumpy old man me, that we found our voice entirely. You know, I do think Irish cinema is still very led by the influence of, of Britain, the influence of uh, American film, as, as, as the whole world is, of course. Um, uh, and I think maybe though we speak English primarily, and that gives us a great advantage internationally, it's quite interesting that these Irish language films seem to have a individuality of their own, which maybe their English language peers are lacking. You know, I do think there's a bit of us that we're still, still craving, you know, that kind of, uh, and, and in a way copying that kind of American version of cinema, you know. Uh, but amongst the young filmmakers now, you can see people slowly carving out individual voices, you know. So, so but, you know, basically, I think the Irish film industry and film culture, which is probably a better word, is in a very strong, uh, an exciting place. Um, but I do think like other small countries across the world, we have to be careful to try and find our own voice that's distinctive and clear. Yes, that's interesting. I'll, 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 I'm actually speaking to Colm Barred later on tonight with, with, with Colleen Kuhn. Uh, just before we leave you, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about uh, the fighting words. Um, which was which is a, a creative writing center. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, Fighting Words is is an extraordinary um, organization uh, that I've recently been honored by becoming the chair of it. But it was founded by Roddy Doyle and and Sean Love, and it's really an initiative to allow, help, encourage young people not exclusively young people, but primarily children and young people uh, to explore their creative voice. You know, there's there's a belief in fighting words, you know, that everybody has, you know, has an inherent creativity and a voice and a story. And it's really about, you know, trying to facilitate through workshops right across Ireland and, and beyond even um, a chance to to, to tell your own story, to express yourself in whatever medium you wish. You know, it could be fiction, it could be graphic novels, it could be songwriting, it could be screenwriting. Um, and, and it's a really kind of extraordinary, you know, I always say about fighting words, anytime I'm feeling a bit kind of down in the dumps or cynical or fed up, you know, if I go into one of those workshops and I see all these young voices, you know, even very, very small kids, you know, starting to write a story or piece a story together. Uh, you know, I, I'm always kind of, 
my spirits are lifted. And, and I suppose it's also about running against, you know, education in Ireland, like most places, is, is, is quite confining. You know, there isn't a place, you know, for the imagination, uh, for the individual, for the creative. It's all, you know, it's all quite mechanical in some ways. And I think what Fighting Words tries to do is celebrate the kind of imaginative possibilities of, of each of us, every one of us. Wow. Um, uh, um, it sounds great. And uh, uh, there's actually a, a similar project that I know of in, in Sydney. I can't think of the, the name of that at, at, off the top of my head, but um, that, it sounds marvellous. Um, Alan, thanks a million for um, taking the time to talk to us and... and um, uh, yeah, uh, the the the, um, the invite is there to come down to Australia when you find time, um, and good luck with the with with the work. Slán agus bannacht. And uh, good luck with your festival. Okay. Thanks a million, Alan. All the best. Bye.